We are live. <laughs> uh, so hello, everyone, and hello also to you uh, joining in from live. Uh, so today uh, we're going to have some interesting talks, I think. Uh, and uh, as Michael mentioned, we're with our uh, with our sponsor here today. And uh, but just briefly about this uh, meetup group, uh, if there is anyone who hasn't been on our uh, sessions before. So we are called now uh, DevOps Gona, former DevOps Malmo. Uh, we chose to change our name actually this year uh, because we are thinking about expanding beyond Malmo. Uh, but uh, so far we haven't been able to, uh, but uh, we hope very soon at least. Uh, but we will keep the Malmo chapter, uh, that's for sure. Uh, so yes, just shortly the agenda. Yes, we have the meet and greet. Uh, we will have some introduction now and some presentations later. Then at 18.30, we'll have the pizza and drinks. Uh, and then we can continue with some discussions and QA. So this is us, uh, me, Frederick, and we also have Evelina and Albert. Unfortunately, they couldn't join us today. Uh, but the group itself, uh, we are on meetup.com. And we're over 1,000 1, members uh, since last year. Uh, and. Uh, this number needs to be, of course, updated every time, but uh, we roughly have 40, 43 meetups now since 2018, um, since the start. So we've been around for a while, and it's super exciting to be here every time. And uh, yes, a big thank you today, of course, to the sponsor, Celastasis. Uh, it's uh, really, uh, I really enjoyed, uh, and we're really enjoying the, the, the talks uh, today. Uh, you can get in touch with us with a few different ways. We have the meetup.com uh, DevOps Malmo. In some uh, places, we're still called Malmo because we couldn't change the name. We had to recreate the whole group, and uh, we didn't feel that was a good idea. So uh, at meetup.com, we're still called DevOps Malmo. We also have now a LinkedIn group uh, for DevOps Gona. You can search for that on LinkedIn. You can find us there. All of our posts uh, will be done there. Uh, and we also have a Slack if anyone would uh, like in some time to join and uh, chat with us. Uh, regarding uh, LinkedIn, uh, we will take some photos here today. Uh, and uh, maybe some other people will also take some photos. But at least for us, we will publish these photos on LinkedIn, uh, some of them. So I asked this before, but I did have some new people here now. Is there anyone who doesn't want to be in a LinkedIn post? All right, great. Uh, Yes, we also have a next meetup planned uh, on March 26. Uh, we will have a company Verifa, uh, which is also the company of one of our hosts, uh, talk about uh, platform teams, and what that means for DevOps, and how to transition from DevOps into pl platform teams. But uh, yeah, that's all for me. Uh, so I'll hand it over to uh, Jonathan at Elasticis. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. Um, I'm not used to doing stuff like this, but uh, I'll give it my best shot. Um, I'm here to just take the house rules for this evening. <laughs> uh, questions from live stream will be answered immediately after the talk. Uh, the questions that you get here, we push to the pizza. So we mingle, take the pizza and some beer, and we'll take all the questions there. And then we also have an award for the best question for the night. So think hard. Uh, it might just be worth it. And I'll then hand it over to my two colleagues, uh, Christian and Lars. Excellent. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So today we're going to talk about developer experience in regulated industry and how it doesn't have to suck. <laughs> and my name is Christian Klein. I'm the data protection officer and the product owner at Elasticis. Yes, and my name is Lars Larsson, and I'm the field CTO at Elasticis. And uh, I will uh, be back soon, but you get to start. Exactly. So, first of all, it's really great to see so many people that have joined us today and showing interest in regulations, all the scary stuff. Unfortunately, my experience is not as positive as I can see tonight. In fact, I'm kind of used to developers having this, let's call it this negativity around regulations, like, ooh, regulation, I don't want rules around my development. I want to be, you know, an artist, free, creative. Don't, don't put constraints on me while writing my code. It's a creative job. 
So let me start a little bit by getting away. Let me, let me get this general stigma away from regulations and create a bit of empathy for why we need them by really ma making you think about, let's say you are on elvashitushi.se, the national healthcare advice uh, website. And how would you feel, for example, if your patient journal leaks and then even worse, they try to hide it from you? Or how would you feel if, for example, a friend who is a developer at, at one of the healthcare providers is just like, ah, check it out, I can check your person journal and I can even change it and pff, doesn't leave any log, any, any log, audit log anywhere. Look how cool it is. Or how would you feel, for example, if you know, the website is just down and you cannot book an appointment for 24 hours and you are just you know, in pain and things like that. And if you feel that any of this is unacceptable, <laughs> rest assured you're not alone. Because such events can really, you know, these are just a few screenshots from, you know, front pages of some famous online websites. And you can see that this, this society thinks that this is unacceptable. We rely on these digital services and we want to have them on and reliable the whole time. And society is, in fact, putting so much weight nowadays on that these things are working properly that... Um, one of the former CEOs of a healthcare company has even received a three-month suspended jail sentence for a leak. So just to give you a bit of an impression, like, yeah, people seem to really care about this. Now, you might ask yourself, but if society really cares so much about information security, then why exactly is this still happening? And this might puzzle some of you because, well, I see that some of you might have worked for like over a decade with security. So you know exactly what are the tools, what are the measures out there. You probably have the most complicated passwords out there. You probably enable two-factor authentication in as many places as could technically be possible. Like, why still this? Why haven't we fixed security once and for all? Well, from a 30,000 feet, this is really how the situation today looks like. So let's just say that the x-axis is time. I haven't put here any proper um, bars because it's kind of just for illustrative purposes. And let's say that the y-axis is like the amount of investment you have put in these issues. And you can see that we're pretty good at digitizing society, right? We can, for example, pay parking uh, from an app and we can book doctor's appointment from an app and we can buy tickets from an app. But unfortunately, the reality is that information security we haven't invested in it quite as heavily as, um, as we have in digitization itself. And here I can just add a bit of anecdotic evidence from my own experience. We had, at some point, a product owner in a travel agency. Um, he was tasked to prioritize, should we integrate with Lufthansa or should we migrate away from Java 6 to Java 8? Um, at that time, Java 6 was about to reach end of life. Yes, that's how old this anecdote is. And that person had to prioritize these two different issues. What do you think that they prioritized? And yes, how did you know? <laughs> um, and then sometime later they got hacked. And wow, who could have expected that one, right? Uh, so th that's, that's simply the reality. That's what's, what's actually happening. And that's why we keep having this gap. But now let me try to understand a bit better. Why does this keep happening? Why, why is security so hard? And the way I see it from a very high level, there are really two problems why security is hard. First of all, is the funding gap. So yes, I wish I had an infinite IT budget uh, or security budget. I wish that everybody in the company you know, would be as knowledgeable as everybody else on information security, but that's just not how market economy works, right? And unfortunately, in a market economy where everybody's racing to bring the cost as low as possible, well, information security is chronically underfunded. And, but even in organizations where I have seen a generous funding gap, there is still a sort of a knowledge gap. I mean, no single organization, no matter how large, knows all of the threats and all of the measures that can be effectively used. They, they don't know what measures should they put in place and in what order to get the biggest banks for the, for the box. And there is a certain asymmetry between defenders and attackers because the attacker only needs to find one single hole, but the defender has to defend against all potential holes that can be found. So the, what I'm trying to highlight here is that even if you had an infinite or a very generous funding uh, for information security, you would still not be able to potentially, you would still risk not putting the right measures in place. 
So that leads us to the EU NIS2 directive. What exactly is the NIS2 directive? Well, as its um, colloquial name suggests, it's an improvement over NIS1 directive. Actually, at that time, it's a bit like with the matrix. The NIS directive was initially called just the NIS directive, and now, now we retroactively call it the NIS1 directive to distinguish between the two. And notice that it's a directive, which essentially means that um, it's just a way for the European Union to tell its member states, you should do this, but it's up to each member state to transpose the NIS2 directive into law in their country. So which means that the actual way that the NIS2 applies in each EU member state might look slightly differently. And now from a 30,000 feet, um, the NIS2 directive is really a stick and a carrot. It is a carrot in the sense that, well, it closes the funding gap. How exactly? Well, it imposes fines. 2% of your total global uh, turnaround. And so then what this tries to achieve is that if you're um, in management and you want like, hmm, do we want to risk 2% of our revenue or should we maybe bump a little bit the budget for information security, that you should find it a bit easier to make the right choice. But then often also um, the NIST2 directive offers a carrot and it tries to knowledge to close the knowledge gap by what I would essentially call an EU-wide hierarchical defines. Haven't I heard this before? Yes. Um, probably you might be familiar with GDPR, which is why we have asked with whether people want to be on LinkedIn or not. Notice, however, that GDPR is really about personal data, so data that can somehow be related directly or indirectly to an individual, whereas the NIST2 directive refers to all kind of information. Um, so, for example, under NIST2, having an accurate schedule over the timetable and not letting some attackers corrupt it is also false within NIST2, whereas GDPR really doesn't care as long as you cannot point to an individual. Now, also notice um, that fines under GDPR are twice as large as under NIST2. But here is the good news, that if you get a breach, uh, which falls both under GDPR and NIST2, you only have to pay the larger one, which is the one from GDPR, which is approximately twice as large as the NIST2. But, well, it's kind of nice that you only have to worry that. So worry first about GDPR and then about NIST2. That's, I think, what the amounts of fine are trying to signal here. And there are two other sister regulations. Uh, one is the Critical Entities Resilience Directive that complements, um, that is mostly focusing on, let's say, staff security and physical security. And then there is also DORA, Digital Operational Resilience for the Financial Sector, which can be seen as a um, special branch of NIST 2 for the financial sector. Now, in this particular presentation, I'm not going to talk about these three, because trust me, I could keep you here all evening just talking about them. So let me go back now to NIST 2. So who is in scope for NIST 2? Who needs to worry about this? And well, kind of everyone. I mean, these are the entities that needed to worry about um, NIS, so the NIS 1 directive, and we can see here energy, transportation, banking, drinking water, healthcare, and so on. And then we notice that NIS 2 has added other entities, such as public administration, manufacturing, digital providers, research. In case you are offering some kind of managed service or a SaaS, you might fall under ICT service management. So in that case, um, you might fall under NIS 2. But I'm not here to get you anxious, right? I'm here to talk about what you need to know in order to succeed with NIS2. And here I have some news. Um, just to destabilize me for this particular presentation, <laughs> this morning, uh, there seems to have been a document that was published around how exactly the Sweden plans to implement the NIS2 and the Critical Antis Resilience Directive in Sweden. Fortunately, I managed to panic read through the executive summary, so what I'm going to present today should be fairly accurate. But uh, let's just say that I did not appreciate the timing. I would have preferred them to publish it one day later and you know, then for me to brag about how I predicted how this could have happened. But fortunately, I'm not going to tell you anything that is contradicting that. Anyway, the way it works is that, um, like I said, technically the NIST2 directive is not yet implemented in Sweden, so we can kind of only predict on how it would look like based on how NIST1 looked like, what the text of NIST2 is, and also the uh, proposal that was just drafted before, so things might still change. 
But I think I have a pretty accurate picture of how this would look like. And essentially, you have the directive which requires EU member states to set up some laws. Then there will be some laws created by the Swedish parliament and the Swedish government. And these laws are not very interesting to read, no offense to those who write them. But essentially, they just give rulemaking power to uh, the Swedish Civil Contingencies Agency. So it's MSB in uh, the acronym in Sweden. And basically, they will actually draft certain rules that are, let's say, containing a little bit more substance, that are more specific and that you can read in order to properly understand what you need to do. So it's mostly this part here that you'll wor be worried about. And to my knowledge, they haven't really, I haven't seen any drafts or anything like that of what will come under NIST 2. Um, but suffice to say that essentially these rules will fall in three big buckets. The first bucket, identify yourself. This is as simple as it sounds. Pick a person in your organization, take their first name, email address, and phone number, and just send an email to MSB. That's it. You're done. Five minutes later. Then the second bucket is with do information security. And I'm going to talk about this a bit later in details. And then the last bucket is report incidents. Yes, you will have to report certain categories of incidents to MSB. And um, a little bit like with GDPR, if after that they encounter that, oh, this was really gross negligence, you should really bump your bad knowledge just gets extracted and then spread to other people without really blaming and shaming your own organization for its deficiencies. So the whole point of the NIST2 directive is to create a, what I like to call it, an EU-wide hierarchical DevSecOps loops. And since this is DevOps malware, I'm not sure I need to get too much into details into DevSecOps, but essentially it's a method in which you're on one hand trying to create awareness of security organization-wide, but on the other hand, you're also trying to push security left. So it shouldn't be like you have these security gates, but rather you should empower the whole uh, organization to and all the application developers to do security. And imagine that NIST2 is pretty much the same thing, but at the European level and with organizations. So on the very bottom, you have um, critical en um, essential entities, such as a power plant, a healthcare system, a medical system, whatnot. These will report incidents and also near misses to their national single contact point. So in Germany, this will be the BSI. In Sweden, this will be MSB. And then each European member state will have its own. And then this one will do the same and will close the loop at the European level. Um, at the level of the European Cybersecurity Agency, which for some reason is, um, for historical reason, has the shortcut ENISA. Um, and then these people will then look at the landscape and they will um, periodically decide on sending new security measures that need to be implemented. And more importantly, they would also publish some kind of awareness reports. So for example, even today, you can just Google ENISA threat awareness landscape, and you can find what ENISA thinks are the biggest threats to information security in 2023. And of course, if somebody in your organization reads that report and says, oh, we should probably, I don't know, take passwords a bit more seriously and enable two-factor authentication, you can already benefit from that quite a lot. Now, the first question that pops your head is probably, what exactly are report-worthy incidents? And this is going to depend very much about how NIST2 will be implemented. Uh, but let's just say that there will be very, very precise definitions for each of those industries on what exactly is a report-worthy uh, in incident. And just to give you a little bit of heads up, um, inspiration, or some examples on report-worthy incidents on the NIST1. So for example, if the ambulance service is anyhow affected, even for one second, that's report-worthy. If, for example, a patient journal is down for more than two hours, again, you have to report an incident. Um, if transportation was affected somehow for more than 10,000 users or for a geographical area of over 10,000 kilometers, square kilometers for at least one hour, that's again report worthy. And you have super specific definitions of what these incidents are for each industry. Um, what is sure is that you will have to send incidents at quite a pace. So the initial incident report needs to come in six hours after you are aware of the incident. Then you need to send an interim report 24 hours after the incident, and then a final report after four weeks. So it's quite a pace and almost feels like you should probably start with this right after you 
identified yourself. So to make sure that your incident report is working properly and to inject that knowledge about, hey, these are serious incidents in your organization. Um, now, what about the security measures? Well, the NIST two um, minimum requirements are essentially non-prescriptive non requirements and one pres prescriptive requirement. So by non-prescriptive, prescriptive, I mean that it doesn't really tell you do this or do that, but rather it feels more like, well, think about and plan around these things. And then one requirement feels very prescriptive, so that really says, like, do this. So what exactly do these non-prescriptive requirements look like? Um, this is basically a copy-paste from the NIST directive, but just to make it fit in a slide, I simplified it radically. Um, people, so you have to have some kind of risk management program. So you need to identify the risks to assess if this risk is serious or not. And then if you deem that it's serious enough to timely implement security measures to mitigate that risk. For those of you who have or work in an organization which is ISO 25000 certified, this must feel like your daily routine, nothing really new here. And then needs to also, ins in also insist on having proper incident handling, which makes sense because how else would you be able to report them? You need to have backup and disaster recovery. So not only we take backups, but actually to regularly test and to train uh, disaster recovery. You need to make sure that you propagate all of these requirements down to the supply chain. So that might mean that even though you are not falling on NIST 2, it could be that you still get a little bit the shower of NIST 2 requirements because your customers might be falling on NIST 2, and then they propagate those requirements over via supply chain security. Network security, vulnerability management, basic cybersecurity hygiene and training. So that's why we, for example, like to lock our laptop if it's outside our site, because that's just what we say is basic hygiene. Um, use of cryptography and encryption, and probably the most important one is humans, human uh, resources security. So make sure that you have a proper onboarding and offboarding checklist so that, well, you don't end up still having access to the Wi-Fi of your previous landlord as uh, we currently have. Um, but then there is also one prescriptive measure which says, I don't know why people in Brussels thought that this was a good idea, but they seem to be really fond of multi-factor authentication. So if you haven't implemented multi-factor authentication and we're looking forward to it, this might be the argument to pass on to your boss to finally implement it. But notice, however, that these are only the minimum NIST requirements and member states are allowed to raise the requirements as high as possible. And I predict that MSB might actually do that. Why do I predict this? Um, because they have one of these rules that are from the NIST 1 era, which applies to all the public administration. And this one goes way beyond what NIST 2 currently was, what NIST 2 required at that time and what NIST 2 will require. So it requires to have separate non-production and production environments. Yay, more Kubernetes clusters. Um, it requires you to separate admin from non-admin access. Um, it requires you to have a proper strategy for change management. It requires you not only to have backups, but to have them tamper-proof. I think the exact formulation is that, well, somebody penetrating in the production environment shouldn't be able to just do RM backup slash star and call it a day. They seem to really like DNSSEC, multi-factor authentication, and they really seem to like the NTB.SE, which, um, as part of this regulation, I learned, is a infrastructure in Sweden to make sure that we have a proper clock here. Uh, despite being disconnected from the rest of the internet. So there's absolutely no excuse for microwave ov for three microwave ovens to show different times once this regulation gets implemented. Yeah, and as you can see, um, it seems to me like the NIST 2 will require almost everyone in the software industry to take information security measures. And um, a common concern that I hear is that, oh my gosh, we have so many things to implement and we're going to have to stall innovation and this is going to have innovation grinding at a halt. How will we deal with all of this? And that's why we're here. We're here to tell you, like, this is not bad. This is creating trust. That's why with, without this kind of trust, people won't be putting their patient data in an IT system. People wouldn't be, you know, people would still be... Uh, using tickets on the paper if they didn't trust that, for example, the application to book tickets is working at all times. So this is actually good for us application developers. And furthermore, it doesn't have to be. We, we can comply with all these regulations and make it fun at the same time. 
So that is why I invite Lars on the scene to tell you exactly how you can make complying with these particular regulations less painful than they initially seem to. Yes, thank you. <coughs> yeah, hi. So, and thank you for that. I mean, you're supposed to be sort of like the bad cop, and I'm sort of the good cop. <laughs> so you're talking about all these things that start to apply to many businesses, and now I get to actually talk about how to use this in practice, or what this means. So, I mean, you're all here because, I mean, the Maybe it's the free pizza and beer, honestly, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but hopefully some of you are here also because of the topic at hand, like developer experience and regulated industries and how it doesn't suck. So by, by show of hands, how many here are actually developers or have at some point been developers or aspire to be developers? Okay, basically everybody. Yes, okay, cool. Right, so um, developer experience is all about what our work is actually like, day-to-day -day work. So it's a vast field. I mean, we're talking like how you interact with tools, with APIs, with platforms, everything that basically affects your line of work as developers. I mean, technically, I guess developer experience could also be like, are my scrum meetings boring? But I mean, I, I can't talk about all of that. Uh, but. I would also like to mention that because this is like also DevOps, Modmask, or whatever, um, basically the developers these days are asked to do so much more than just develop. A lot of developers are also asked to do quite a bit of operations. So besides everything that goes into just developing software, well, I'd actually also like to put in the operational aspect of it because that also affects how you do your day-to-day -day work. Where do you check your logs in the system? How do you get monitoring values out? All that kind of thing. <coughs> All right, so uh, because everybody here is essentially a developer, that's lovely, uh, you all have some kind of experience with being a developer. So developer experience is really about how do these systems that you have to use support either your own everyday work or that of your team. Um, yeah, developer's experience is supposed to not suck. <laughs> then people are way more effective at work. So as you can tell, I mean, developer experience is a very broad topic. So it includes, for instance, onboarding processes for new developers, documentation quality and accessibility, and that's both like internal and external documentation, obviously. So like the documentation that you both have to write and the ones you have to read and try to understand how stuff works. API usability, you know, such as starting out with it, that might be okay, but going like over time, sometimes it's not so great. I mean, who here has worked with SQL stored procedures in a database? Yeah, that was maybe fun to start with, but then it became increasingly less fun when you had to actually maintain that thing over time. Um, SDKs, libraries, availability, blah, 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 sample code, tutorials, all of it, so much more. And I'm also aware of the fact that I'm basically all that stands between you and pizza. So <laughs> I, <laughs> just like he couldn't go into detail with all of the like GDPR, CER, Dora, right, thanks. I will talk about part of it. And the fact that it looks like a Death Star was not really intended. <laughs> but I very much enjoy it now that I see it. Okay, so therefore, I will limit myself to these points. They were also in the agenda. So, immediate feedback via policies code, secure yet simple development, uh, sorry, deployment via GitOps, and security in depth via container platforms. So, let's dive into the first one and get to the other ones later. So many decades ago, this is how you'd program a computer. I don't think anyone is old enough to have done this. I have not done this. I have a beard that's getting grayer and whiter by the day, but I'm still not that old. Um, here you punch holes in cards and you have to put them into the computer and it gets to read them in sequence. So if you had an error somewhere, you would probably find out like, I don't know, next week. I don't know. Th this, this was like horrible. Uh, feedback was slow. But today's developers, we're used to immediate feedback. We want to get uh, that the computer tells us when we've made a mistake. So this is from um, from, from Rust, <coughs> which is probably the best compiler out there. Is anyone here fortunate enough to work in Rust? 
No, <laughs> of course not. But this is what like everybody on Hacker News wants to do: uh, write code in Rust. Uh, so I mean, you have a very smart compiler that will tell you immediately if you did something wrong. So here, like, it's actually going to underline the thing that you did wrong. It's going to tell you exactly what you did, and then the fact that it does that means that you can actually quickly fix it. This is what we want. So if we do something wrong, we want to be immediately told that we did something wrong because then, A, we can Google it and figure out, like, what did I do wrong? How do I fix it? And, I mean, developers are smart people. Everybody here is a smart person, right? If we see, if we get told that something is wrong, we will want to just fix it. It's not like we want to leave errors in there. The problem is, if we're not aware that we left errors in there, then we can have those problems that Christian showed right from the start with like these massive breaches and stuff like that. <coughs> so if you don't get that type of feedback and there's an error and you have to actually go hunt for it, that's so much more difficult than if you can get some kind of tool support. And with company policies especially and also with regulatory compliance requirements, that's sadly often the case, right? I mean, you have all kinds of rules written in all kinds of policies, uh, but if they're not automatically enforced, do you really know if you've broken them? Or are they just some document that you have forgotten about? In most cases, these things just wind up being forgotten. And that's because feedback is either that you get hacked, that's, that's one type of feedback, it's not very pleasant, or you know that your, your data protection officer comes by and says uh, something, or, uh, or that you would actually get a fine. Uh, Either way, it's not great, okay? We need to have something against that. And as I said, uh, to make it more complex, you, you often, as developers, also have to take on like operational responsibilities, like managing deployment, scalability, performance, all that alongside all the coding stuff, right? And within all that, security, the topic of today, really. A lot of topics have been you know, with developers for a long time, such as the scalability and stuff like that. Like everybody knows they want to have, you know, the most efficient software and, you know, developers obsess about that. But security can sometimes be difficult because as Christian said, there's this, there is a knowledge gap and there's often a funding gap. And that funding gap really puts like a upper cap on how much time you get to dedicate to this type of work. So, that can lead to vulnerabilities, risking data breaches, and system compromises. Not great. So, besides making software like user-friendly, perform well, you have all kinds of security-related requirements to deal with. And now the problem is that these tasks are technical, but they're not really like development either, really. Uh, and that's the reason why you wind up with security misconfigurations causing 35% of all cyber incidents, <laughs> apparently, according to some research. I, I don't know, they, they have a machine or something to figure out that. But I mean, the thing is still, uh, nobody wants to make mistakes, but if you do make mistakes and you wouldn't know, then you wind up in trouble and you can't really fix it after the fact. <laughs> it's, it's, really, it's really bad. Um, so some of those issues that I briefly let fly up here they seem rather difficult to deal with. I understand that. But the good news is that there are tools that exist that check for such security misconfigurations so that you don't do the sort of like stupid beginner mistakes. And they provide immediate feedback. So they, uh, they will tell you before anything actually happens, before an insecure configuration is put in place, that you have done something wrong. So again, it's not like anyone wants to purposefully misconfigure anything, but if one simply doesn't know, that's how mistakes happen. So what about that solution? Well, collectively, this is called like policy as code. For instance, you can have like an organization such as the Center for Internet Security, CIS. People here have probably worked like CIS benchmarks at some point, right? Yeah. So technically speaking, those are policies that just sit there somewhere, but People do actually read them, and then people actually also implement all kinds of technical ways to detect, like, have you broken this policy or not? So then you can get like a CAS benchmark score. So something that tells you how well you're conforming to these uh, policies or not. And ideally, you want to make sure you have immediate feedback, of course. So 
we have all kinds of nice projects like this, the open policy agent, weird Viking helmet thingy, uh, that is this very general rule evaluation engine that you can use. Uh, basically, it takes JSON in, does some rule inference using a weird logic language, and then spits out the JSON response. That's what it does. Uh, honestly, that might not seem very user-friendly, and I would possibly also agree, um, but it's very powerful. It's very general. You have other systems like Kix and Cubescape that wrap basically this uh, open policy agent and make it way more user friendly. So, if like Kix is actually an acronym for like keep infrastructure code secure or something like that, and Cubescape is of course like this special tool developed for Kubernetes purposes. Uh, and it can check like the CAS benchmarks, but also against like best practices by the U.S. Uh, you know NSA uh, authority, like the spy people. They're really good at securing Kubernetes clusters. It turns out, and uh, they publish this guide that all U.S. authorities should be following about how to ho security harden. And well, everybody else can do it the same way too. Um, so these tools help make policies actually enforceable, and therefore they stop them from being broken and they stop them from being just these paper documents that nobody actually cares about. Uh, so it turns into this fail-fast system that prevents code uh, that is incorrect somehow and deployment instructions from making these policy-breaking errors. So this is great stuff. I, who here is using policy as code already, purposefully? All right. Cool. Not a lot of people. <laughs> How many here are using some kind of git commit hook? Uh, a few. I mean, that's kind of sort of some kind of policy as code, right? I mean, it probably runs some kind of static checker for you. I mean, pr you probably have some automated tests running on every like commit. Yeah, yeah. So some minor nodding going on. Okay, uh, you need this talk. <laughs> I'm happy you're here. <laughs> uh, welcome. So, why does it matter? Well, as I said, you want policies to be enforced, not just documented. You want experts to write rules. Like, for instance. You don't need to be an expert to install this Cubescape stuff. There's an entire startup dealing just with writing these rules, and you can just benefit from that. Of course, if you have internal experts, if you have like an internal IT department, or if you have like people that are on a platform team, apparently, topic for next DevOps scone session, then you actually have experts writing those rules, and everybody follows because they can't not. I mean, they can't avoid following them. This means you have less tribal knowledge in the team as well, because all of a sudden it stops being about like, oh, this is how we do it here at this company. No, it's like you try to do something wrong and the system tells you you did it wrong. So basically I can pick up any developer off the street essentially, put them into this project, and if they try to do stuff wrong, the system will catch it. Well, okay, that's the ideal. That's not really how it is. But I mean, that's the ideal we're shooting for here. Uh, it prevents mistakes. Therefore, also, it increases your confidence because you know that if there was any obvious mistake in here, it would have been caught already. Provides immediate feedback as well. That's lovely. Okay, so you want to have simple deployment because you don't want to have all these like difficult ways of deploying software. Uh, who here is already using some kind of GitOps? A few, a few. More than we're using policy as code. Okay. If there's overlap, I'm happy for you. Okay, so Git ops, what that means is basically that we have all kinds of smart like administration tools these days for uh, doing stuff with infrastructure, whether that's like cloud infrastructure or working with a platform, like for deploying stuff onto say Kubernetes. And they typically work in a declarative way, that basically you say, here's what I want to have happen, but I don't necessarily lay out all the steps. So I don't have to say, first create this load balancer, then create a server or like a set of servers, put them behind the... I don't need to say exactly how in which order stuff needs to happen. I can just declaratively give like a shopping list to the system and say, here's what I want, make so that I have it and the system will take care of reconciling that over time. So, if I have these smart systems that can basically take some kind of text file as input to understand what they're supposed to do, that file can sit in a Git repository people figured out. And then you can automatically, just as the file updates in Git, you can run the command 
and essentially do operations that way. So you commit to your code, you push it, and automation does the rest. And the nice thing about this is it becomes as reviewable and auditable as your source code itself, because all this is is essentially source code that tells the system what you want to have done. Right? You with me so far? Excellent. Now, this sounds like something that, I mean, you could have implemented like 20 years ago, more, 40 years ago. I mean, you had, as long as we've had version control, of course you could have had something to run and just do some stuff based on the files that are in that version control. Now, GitOps systems these days, like Argo, this, this happy octopus fellow, and Flux, for instance, they have these smart ways of dealing with like per branch or per pull request uh, deployments as well. Uh, this is great for testing and reviewing. I mean, that's rather obvious. But they also support like advanced deployment strategies. So if you think, if when I said you could have done this with just like run a script when something has changed, basically you could have done this with a cron job, you know, eons ago. No, what this is so cool because here you can actually, these are prepared to do automated advanced deployment strategies like blue-green deployments or canary deployments and to have automated testing to advance incrementally uh, after a certain amount of time. So let's, let's see a, an image of that. So I've, I've stolen this from Flagger uh, app. Um, Flagger is the uh, continuous release component of Flux. So you have end users that um, make requests to an ingress in Kubernetes. Who's using Kubernetes? Yes, OK, quite a few. Uh, so but anyways, the way to get traffic into a Kubernetes environment. Let's just leave it at that. Um, so Flagger will make sure that you have the service deployed both in like the primary version and in like the canary, like the next version. So all, uh, all somebody did was update and say, here's a new version. Flagger understands that it shouldn't just immediately go and deploy that new version, it should do it incrementally. So first it's going to deploy the canary, then it's going to sit and monitor it using integration with the monitoring system for like 15 minutes, if, and send 10% of traffic to the new version, 90% to the old one, and then check, like, is the new version responding correctly? Does it like give, you know, HTTP 200 something responses? And if it seems to behave correctly, after, after 15 minutes, Flagger will say, OK, well, now we can uh, switch. Now we can make it 100% of traffic goes there, or maybe like 50% goes to the canary, and let's see if it performs well as, uh, as well. So you can have all kinds of automated tests. So it sounds so simple that all you have to do is change one number in a file that's tracked by Git and commit and push it, and that's actually true. And yet you can still have these really nice automated uh, and advanced workflows. Like most people haven't even reached this point yet, but it's possible with automation, so it's really cool. Um, I'd say that doing any admin or operational work is basically like a can of worms, because I mean you will forget to do things. So there's a risk of human error if you have to do things manually. Um, that gives you version or configuration drift. That's really bad. Because everything is stored in Git and applied by a computer, basically you don't reduce tribal knowledge you can actually remove it because it's the nobody sits there and runs commands anymore. Nobody needs to be that like expert that is the one that knows the secret commands that you always have to run. No, this is actually possible that you encode everything and it's stored in Git. So this gives you a significant risk and cost reduction and disaster recovery and like from scratch deployment. It's all about reading that file and Restoring data, of course. So if you have data in a database, yes, you have to restore that. But then all like application component stuff, that's already stored in Git, and that just needs to be applied and brought up to speed. So that's pretty impressive. Of course, this also means that you have simplified for yourself using for like compliance and governance reasons, because you have this one single source of truth, the Git repository. You have a clear audit trail, who did what and when. Perhaps also why, if you're you know, being good with commit messages. But everybody here writes good commit messages, yes? Yes, yes, they're all very descriptive. Uh, but of course, in modern Git systems, you also have this concept of like code owners, so like who gets to update which file. 
protected branches, review processes. So before going live in production, maybe two people need to sign off on uh, a change before it is pushed through the automated system. So you have all these things, and that really is awesome when you are doing like a security audit. Yeah, I smell the pizza too. I know, I'm going to pick it up. Um, <laughs> so security in depth via container platforms. So who here is using containers? Not everybody was on Kubernetes, but a lot of people are on containers. That's cool. OK, excellent. Let's save some time. I don't need to go into too much depth about containers. But if you're the one that didn't raise a hand, you have immu containers are really about immutable, complete packaging of software, artifacts, and their dependencies. That's a so-called container image. So some kind of process built takes all dependencies of a piece of software, starting from the operating system and going all the way up, shared library, everything, just smooshes it all together into one immutable package. That's called the image. Then you have a container runtime that looks at that image and says, oh, cool, I need to run this program, and it runs that program. So essentially, you were completely away from all this, well, it worked on my machine type of problem, which is probably also the reason why more people raised their hand when I asked about who's using containers than who's using Kubernetes, because containers are really, really useful. Kubernetes is also. But containers, uh, it's very obvious for developers why that matters. And container platform is then a set of software that runs these containers across multiple servers and you know, handles networking, handles logs, monitoring information, et cetera. Now, container platforms, is that the exact same thing as just saying Kubernetes but with two words instead of one? No. Well, yes and no, sort of. So, as one of the most influential voices in the Kubernetes community said, uh, Kubernetes is a platform for building platforms. So it's a better place to start, but it's not the end game. Um, Kubernetes by itself basically just figures out, here's a set of servers, here's a set of containers, and I'm going to assign which containers run on which servers. If one of the servers crashes, I need to figure out a new placement. That's basically all Kubernetes does. The rest, it depends on other systems. I mean, it depends on it for networking, for um, like getting traffic in, like I said before, with the ingress. So this is an example of an entire container platform. You, you'll notice that Kubernetes is sitting here as one component in like an entire big thing, which is a container platform. Yes, it's ours. No, it's not here to sell. That's not the point. The point is to show that it's, it's basically you need to have more than just Kubernetes to have a Kubernetes platform. So you, I mean, you need something to collect logs, store them centrally, do monitoring, do backups, all of it. I mean, you need stuff to handle things for you so that you have a smart platform. Because this is really about developer experience. Who here wants to deal with all this stuff? Great. Nobody raises their hand. Not even people working at... Okay. <laughs> <laughs> he is the product owner. He deals with it from the other end. Um, but let's zero in on security features that one would reasonably expect from a container platform and how that helps developer experience not suck. Because as it turns out, you can get a lot of security features from a container platform. So everybody here that's using containers, this slide is for you. If, if you're using containers and you're not using Kubernetes, oh, wow, this slide is for you. Because, so basically, you have your containerized software running in here. That's the core of it. A container platform can put all kinds of layers of security around it so that you, as a developer, don't have to deal with certain security aspects. You should not necessarily have to deal with, you know, firewalling your own component. That should be done by something else. Um, it's great if something is isolating your container so that it runs in a sandbox and it can't actually do dangerous stuff. And if it would do dangerous stuff, it's nice if something has scanned it and prevented it from running in the first place. Um, somehow you need to have secrets, like configuration being put into it. You don't want to have to deal with integrating with various like secret stores or whatever, necessarily. You'd rather just have that injected somehow into your container. Like Think of all the code you don't have to write, because every written line of code is basically not an asset to your company. It's more like a liability, because you have to maintain that line of code. And you don't, need, you don't want to do this stuff, necessarily. Monitoring and logging, well, 
as you know, you're using containers, it's very standardized. You just write on standard output and monitoring, well, you can ask the container runtime for all kinds of information. That's also nice if it winds up in a platform. Security updates, patches, encryption of data at rest and in transit, do you really want to deal with that stuff or do you just want something to take care of it? Like a smart network around it that takes care of encryption and transit. Um, intrusion detection system. Stuff that you don't have to make your piece of software understand and do, but you can get as a service from a platform. That's what you want. Because all of this together means that you don't have to develop these things yourself. So what it ma why it matters is that you get security by design, not by accident. So you know for a fact that it's there. Multiple layers of always on security. That's what you want, and you want to have defense and depth. You want to have like layers upon layers of security embedding your piece of software. And of course you want to combine it with the benefits of Pulse's code and with GitOps so that you basically reach some kind of developer experience nirvana. Because if you have a platform that's you know, somebody else's problem, then developers can develop. And I think that's the main message here. That's the main way to make sure developer experience doesn't suck. And that's by letting developers actually develop. Because you want to automatically enforce policies, you want immediate feedback, you want to have CI, CD, like building and deploying, you want to have that super smooth, no manual administration, you don't really want all that stuff. You're not, you don't want to do that stuff yourself, you want it to just be done. You want to stay in the IDE as much as possible, right? Because you probably like customize it with all kinds of fonts and plugins, and you probably love your IDEs, I'm sure you do, like your development environments. So. And GitOps is great for that because then you can sit there and you commit and you push and ta-da, I mean, then you don't need to worry because the automation will take care of the rest. So ideal, let the systems or some kind of experts manage everything that isn't development. And well, we have one solution and Verifa obviously has another one. They're the next talk, next time DevOps going and meets up, they're going to talk about platform teams, but that's it from us. So thank you so much. Um, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> <laughs> so my question is, do we have any questions from the online audience that we should do now while the stream is still active? No. <laughs> OK. <laughs> yes. So thank you very much. Thank you. Really interesting talk. And thank you all for coming as well here thank today. You. I mean, uh, you guys are the community. So we really appreciate you coming here. And uh, for those of you who are new, feel free to join. <laughs> Thanks. Yes. Now let's have Thank some you. pizza, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.